Hello, and welcome to the virtual AWP Conference and Book Fair. I am Kim Ching Kui, a member of the AWP Board of Directors. For accessibility, I'd like to offer a physical de description of myself. I'm a petite white woman with, with short blonde hair, and I'm wearing a black shirt and um, uh, silver earrings and a silver neck necklace. Um, we are delighted to bring you this event today. Before we introduce our feature presenters, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Red Hat and Press, sponsors of today's event. Our literary partners and sponsors allow AWP to present these extraordinary literary, literary events and help us keep our conference portable and accessible. A thank you to all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. This event is taking place live on March 6 from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Central Time. After the conclusion of this event, it will be available for on-demand viewing. This event is being live captioned through stream text. Please find the link to access stream text from your browser in the event description. A transcript of the event will be available for on-demand viewing. During the live event, please enter your questions or comments into the platform chat box on the right of the screen. Time permitting, there will be a brief question and answer where the, moderator, where the moderator will take questions from the platform chat. If you're watching on demand, feel free to continue to leave comments in the chat box to the right of the video. We thank you so much for attending and for your continued support of ADWP. We hope you enjoy this event. Thank you to AWP and to Red Hen Press for hosting us and welcome to Fierce LA Women Write Stories That Change the Paradigm with Amy Bender, Susan Strait, Lisa Teasley, Dana Johnson, and I'm your moderator, Amy Liu. I am the author of Glorious Boy, published last year by Red Hen, as well as three previous novels and a variety of nonfiction I teach in Goddard College's MFA program in creative writing. So Los Angeles writers, by which we really mean the whole of Southern California, Susan, that's for you. Um, what names spring to mind when you hear that phrase? Kane, Chandler, Fonte, West, Isherwood, Waugh? These are the names that dominate LA's literary history. And as you might have noticed, they all belong to white men. As recently as 2002, only eight of the 58 writers included in a major anthology of LA writing were female. Men dominated the Southern California publishing scene and academia too. But as our panel proves, those demographics are changing. Fierce women writers of LA are more than coming into their own and we have several of the fiercest here today. So I'm going to introduce them. Um, Dana Johnson is the author of the story collections in the Not Quite Dark and Break Any Woman Down and the novel Elsewhere, California. Dana is professor of English at the University of Southern California. Her latest book is Trailblazer, Delilah Beasley's California, uh, very appropriate for our topic of fierce women. Delilah was one of the fiercest. Susan Strait is the author of eight novels, including A Million Nightingales, Between Heaven and Here, and High Wire Moon. Susan is Distinguished Professor of Creative Writing at UC Riverside, and her latest work is the memoir In the Country of Women, also very appropriate for today's conversation. Lisa Teasley's books include the novels Heat Signature and Dive, and the story collection Glow in the Dark. Lisa also wrote and starred in the BBC TV documentary, High School Prom, and she is editor at large for Los Angeles Review of Books. And finally, Amy, Amy Bender is the author of six books of fiction, including the novels, The Butterfly Lampshade, re released last year, and An Invisible Sign of My Own. Her most recent story collection is The Color Master. Amy teaches creative writing at USC. Um, so unfortunately on Zoom, it's a little hard to have a, a, a free flowing conversation. So I'm going to pose a series of questions about Southern California's impact on uh, the panelists as writers and they will answer in a kind of a round robin fashion. 
So first of all, tell us about your personal history with LA and Southern California more widely and the role this place plays in your work, especially your most recent books. And let's start with you, Dana, and take it around the room. Okay, so um, I was born and raised here in Los Angeles, um, born in General Hospital, which is now known as USC Medical Center. And my parents migrated uh, from Tennessee to Watts. And so my early years, I was raised in South Central LA on 80th and Vermont. And then we moved to the suburbs in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, and then I moved back toward LA uh, to go to undergrad, which was at USC. And so I've lived all over Echo Park, Silver Lake. I know Chino, I know Riverside, I know Moreno Valley. I've, uh, and now I live downtown uh, since 2005. So I, the way that place influences me is just, I'm always trying to figure out ways to write about the city as I know it and the suburbs of the city as I know it. And so a lot of my work has varies in terms of space. Like sometimes it's very deserty. Sometimes it's, you know, downtown LA. Sometimes it's very suburban. Um, and so I'm just trying to, in some ways, document the Los Angeles that I know. And my most recent project, um, thank you, Amy, for holding up a trailblazer. Um, it was a project that I did with the Huntington Library and uh, cultural arts organization Clock Shop about this extraordinary woman that people don't know about. She came from Ohio, um, fell in love with California and she traveled far and wide documenting all the Negro pioneers and people that she thought uh, everybody should know about who should go down in history and know. Um, and so, I think about her work a lot and her project of really trying to illustrate a California, um, particularly a black California that a lot of people don't know about. Um, and so she's inspired me a lot lately, just thinking about her project and thinking about my work and what I want to do, continue to keep doing um, in terms of representing California and all of its uh, very variations. Susan. Oh, that's a great way to start because um, they, Amy, Amy's saying that because I'm in Riverside, which is 60 miles east of Los Angeles. But it's so interesting to hear Amy bring up all those men, right? And then to think that the man who influenced me most, which I don't know what you guys are gonna think about this, was John Retchie. Like I love John Retchie. To me, he was like the the LA writer that made made me think in a certain way. But um, I've lived in River, Riverside pretty much my whole life. I was born three blocks down the street, and Riverside is three hundred and fifty thousand people. And then you get to Pomona and San Bernardino and Chino and LA. And so it's a fascinating question because, of course, for us, LA was the big city because we were out here you know, in the orange groves, cattle, marijuana farms way back in the 70s and 60s. And I often thought of LA as the promised land, like where I, I had to go to LA to be a writer. And when I got to LA, I realized that I already knew so much history because of my family. Um, my real father, my biological father had a terrible life. His father was a criminal and a cowboy. And my father was brought to Echo Park when he was nine. Um, on the bus from the highest place in Colorado and grew up near Angela's Temple, which was Amy Semple McPherson. So my dad would tell me stories about watching at nine years old, Amy Semple McPherson fly across a wire, you know what I mean, to be levitated and catch on fire. So like that, but she was an amazing woman in LA history. And I wrote all these unpublished stories. You guys are going to crack up um, my fellow panelists, but I was 19 and I wrote all these stories about my great aunt who was Amy Semple McPherson's um, pupil. And so I started thinking about LA in terms of all the different communities, just like Dana's talking about. And my mother was an immigrant. She didn't 
become a citizen until I was already three because she wanted to vote for John F. Kennedy because he was so cute. That's what she said. Um, she was in love with Vin Scully and that's who taught her to speak English. And Vin Scully is a legendary Dodgers broadcaster. So we went to Dodger Stadium all the time and my mother was literally in love with Vin Scully. And I realized that that was an essential part of my growing up. And these are the things I ended up writing about in the memoir, like I'd written fiction about them. But to think about how much LA history was in my family, I met my future husband when I was 15 years old here. And we used to drive to LA all the time to see his uncles and his aunt. And um, the picture that's above me that I'm kind of pointing to, that's my mother-in-law, Alberta Sims, and her sister, Rosie. So I was thinking a lot about untold stories because what I was trying to do in the memoir was to, to write down all those stories that all of these heroic women told me about LA and about California and traveling here from Sunflower County, Mississippi, and then living in Riverside, which is where my mother-in-law um, lived. And also another great woman, Aunt Jenny, who lived at 21st and Central, you know, South Central, literally 21st and Central, there's, there was a uh, historic ice house there, and now it's a recycling center. When I go to LA, I think about Crenshaw, Compton, Inglewood, and Watts, because those are the places that all the uncles lived, and we had a holiday for each one. And so I always wanted to write about that LA. And um, the writers that meant the most to me were the people writing about that LA, like Wanda Coleman, John Recce, Elena Maria Viramontes was hugely influential, as well as Carolyn C. So in all of my novels and all of this, this, this memoir, it's this traveling between all of the villages and neighborhoods that make up um, immense amounts of Southern California. And I don't think there's any other place like it. And when people are like, well, how could you never leave? I'm like, but how could I ever leave? There's so many stories still to tell. So um, Lisa, what do you think? Well, I was born here in LA like Dana and um, my father came here from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he was computing trajectories to the moon in the space program. And every Sunday he would take us on, you know, like Sunday drives and say, I love LA, I love California. You know, it was about the weather and the sun and, you know, the vibe. And so that was kind of instilled in me, that love. And then my mother came here from Panama. And so from her, um, I had an eye toward just the multitude of cultures here. So, um, and I, I've been in LA for most of my life, although I did live in New York for seven years. And for when I was a kid, we lived in Durham, North Carolina for a bit as well. But um, I've, I was raised in Baldwin Hills. I've lived in Koreatown, in Laurel Canyon. Um, I'm now living in Venice, various other places. Um, but it was really um, my mother and my father who um, gave me that desire to travel and explore, inspired by all the various cultures here. It's a, it's a world city. So my, my work, my stories and my novels tend to be about people who are traveling because I, I feel that to be a place where people are most themselves because they're vulnerable and they're discovering who they are outside of their terrain. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, so my work is about being a native, but also about all kinds of other people from other places. Amy? I love hearing all these. Um, so I'm also an LA native. I grew up here and my mom also grew up here in the Valley in North Hollywood where her parents had moved from um, the East Coast for opportunity and, and she was raised there. And my dad was um, born in the Midwest in a really small town and was the only Jewish family in a tiny town and really wanted to move to a big city. And his sister had moved to LA. And also Lisa, like your dad was just like this weather these mosquitoes are nothing, you know, like this is amazing. And like, you know, they, he just, he just loved it. And, and, and so they, and it was like that, that sort of, that sort of was helpful in some way in terms of appreciating LA also. And I grew up on the West side, sort of Brentwood, Santa Monica area, and it felt quite suburban. I live now um, 
Miracle Mile-ish, it feels more like the city. I think it felt, I felt a real sort of, um, the city felt not as um, sort of palpable in some way to me as a kid and it feels much more, I feel much more a part of it now in a certain way. Um, but I think, and maybe similarly, I think I always felt there was this real split between um, LA as presented in film and LA as a film city versus LA as a city that you live in and that is just the place that you're from and it's just, you know, the sort of mythos of LA versus the ordinariness of living somewhere and so that's been part like initially my first few books weren't really placed anywhere they were more in this kind of fairy tale realm and it was a land or it was a street and things were unnamed and that was in some ways deliberate because I think I hadn't quite figured out how to ground those pieces and it didn't feel right yet but there was kind of a change in the particular sadness of lemon cake of really wanting it to be in LA and to be in sort of this mid-city area that I'd lived at that point for many years and and how much I loved looking at the trees and the houses and the apartments and just walking around and wanting to have that really that dailiness feel very much part of the the fictional world that I was building and to feel like that could be alongside the magic and the sort of influence of fairy tales to have it grounded in a real place and it's been meaningful to hear back from readers over time just that like some people who've never been to LA and who've only seen LA um you know, I think it's changed a lot actually in terms of representations of LA, but but just for a while, you know, it feels like there was there was just the sense of of one side of it being emphasized and, and others not. And so it's just been nice for people to be like, oh, people go to the market <laughs> book. It's like, well, of course. Um, so so I think that's been part of the experience of trying to write about this city and, and it's such a huge city and so multifaceted that of course, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's plenty to be written for a long time. Back to you, Annie. So especially since we're having this conversation during Women's History Month, it's important to stress that the dominance of men in the LA uh, literary scene for more than a century masked the influence of a great many powerful women. And we've heard from Susan and Dana about just the tip of the iceberg on that. But I wonder with that in mind, if you guys uh, had female mentors or other literary role models here as you came up and, and if so, how they informed your work uh, on a personal basis. Uh, Dana? Muted. Unfortunately, I did not have uh, female mentors when I was first trying to be a writer and thinking about being a writer. Uh, I was kind of alone in that. I had a lot of um, fantastic male mentors. Um, writer named Lou Matthews in particular was very helpful to me, sort of negotiating uh, the writing world but two writers were always sort of like uh, shining models in the distance. And that was for me, of course, Wanda Coleman, like a lot of people, but I also was really, um, really taken with Octavia Butler because she was someone who was writing about sort of a Los Angeles that I kind of knew about, which was like the kind of Pasadena area. And, and so she, writers like both she and Wanda Coleman made the city feel uh, accessible and important to write about. I think one of my, one of the things that I was misguided about as a young writer was this idea that because I came from someplace like South Central or West Covina or wherever it was that I was living, nobody would know what who where West Covina was or like what kind of town or suburban city it was. And so I thought it wasn't important to write about these places. I would have to figure out a way to write about a uh, California that was like impressive to other people or something. That's what I was like, you know, as a very young writer thinking. But writers like uh, Coleman and Butler again made me understand that writing about Los Angeles and all of its suburbs and the whole state is a uh, California's a state is 
really important, not just for me as a writer, but to literature in particular, really important to have these kinds of representations. As Amy said, it's changing more and more. Television, I think, is more ahead of the curve than literature in terms of how places represented Los Angeles and all its areas. But these two writers, um, they were really helpful to me in terms of thinking about taking my own place seriously and understanding the power that I had writing about these places that I know so well. Susan, what are your thoughts on this? While we were answering the first question, I kept thinking of who, who's watching us now, you know, who our audience is. And I'm remembering exactly a year ago being in San Antonio because I came, um, that was the last place I went. And I had a panel called Badass Women and it was Reiko, Rana Reiko Rizzuto, um, Elena Maria Viramontes and me and Luis Rodriguez showed up and he was hanging out with us and at least 12 of my former students, all of whom were um, Latino or Latina writers from California originally. And I was thinking about this so, so for all the people who are watching us who are young writers, I have to be honest, just like you were just now, Dana, and to say, I went to school, I was young, I was 22, I was already married. Um, and I drove across the country with my husband who looked like Magic Johnson back then, he looks much more like Shaquille O'Neal now, that's a big man. But back then he looked like Magic Johnson and we drove across the country and people were terrible to us. And we arrived at UMass Amherst, which is where I got my degree. And my mentor was James Baldwin. And so James Baldwin was the one who told me, this is a place you have to write about. And I had been suffering because the other professors who were all white men would literally not read my story and write on the bottom one word, sociology. My fellow students, I haven't thought about this in a long time, you know, my fellow students would come up to me because I have, I looked exactly like I look now. I've looked like this since the eighth grade. My hair hasn't changed. Um, they would say, oh, you're blonde and you're from LA. Are you gonna write about Hollywood or the ocean? And I remember getting really mad and I'd say, we don't have water where I live. I'm not trying to write about the ocean. And they're like, what do you mean you don't have water? And I'm like, I live out in the orange groves between the deserts and the mountains. And so it was actually being angry about how everybody treated me like I was dumb. I had not one professor who treated me like I had a brain in my head. And I was married to a tall black man. So I had three professors try to fail me and claim I was cheating because they said, we saw you walking around campus with, with a tall black man. We also couldn't get into the bar where James Baldwin held his after workshop um, gatherings because they wouldn't let us into the bar with California driver's licenses. They said those were not recognizable in Massachusetts. So this was 1984 when I came home I wrote my first two short stories about California, having been told not to do that, right? And I'm telling you this because it's weird. They were all about the boom box. James Baldwin had come to our apartment for dinner. He said it reminded him of the ghetto in Harlem. It was so tender. Our apartment was very student housing and we had this boom box and we played him George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic. And that's an LA sound. You know what I mean? If you're driving and you hear Funkadelic. I wrote two short stories. One was about a girl on a bus in South Central because I rode the bus always in South Central. And we got robbed one day. A guy went around with a gun and he took everything we had as we were sitting on the bus. But my friend, Mary Batiste, who was from 63rd and Crenshaw, Dana, she wouldn't give up her radio. And he said he was gonna kill us. And she still wouldn't give up her radio. So that was my first short story that I wrote. Um, and my only mentor then was James Baldwin and Mary Batiste. And I keep thinking about what it meant to be from California back then and what it meant to have people say, oh, you're from La La Land. You know, what could you possibly have to write about? And so I'm saying to all the young writers out there, you got to write about your place. Like, that's what we have. Um, the later writers, Amy, that were my mentors, I met, you know, when I would go to L.A. And that was Wanda Coleman was a big deal. Wanda Coleman wrote about that LA that I knew. And also Carolyn C was really a big deal because she was such a visionary. She wrote a, a she wrote futuristic things about Topanga Canyon. Who could imagine that? 
And then again, Elena Maria Viramontes was writing about the East LA um, that was so similar to the neighborhood that I was growing up in. So it's a great question. And um, I'm sorry to bring up the hard stuff, but I think younger writers, you got to know the hard stuff, which is not everybody's going to understand you in the beginning. So you have to like buckle down with your people. Sorry, <laughs> Lisa. Uh, my first mentor was Montserrat Fontes in high school. We, uh, she was the journalism teacher at University High and really sort of took me under her wing. She, she told me right away that I had a talent for fiction rather than journalism. And, um, and she's written novels about um, the Mexican community in LA, Texas, Mexico. Um, so I've had her in my life since I was 16 years old. And so, you know, here, four decades later, we're still in touch. Um, then when I was at UCLA, um, Yasha Kessler, who was kind of uh, known as sort of the a-hole on campus and had ripped apart my, uh, the story, the very first day of class with him, ripped it apart. Everybody was, you know, kind of just freaked out. I called my mother after class crying and she said, just write a tighter story for the next week which I did, you know, every week, you know, but he's, you know, he, he stayed tough, but it wasn't until the very end of the semester that he told me that he had submitted my work for an award that I won. So I got used to, Monsi was also tough. Montserrat was also tough and so was Yasha. So um, I, I really responded to that. And then I met my idol, Wanda Coleman, who took me under her wing. She would uh, take me to Cal State Long Beach to read with her every year. We were doing that for like, I don't know, it felt like maybe six or seven years and also some other gigs as well. And, um, and also she edited an anthology for the women's building and included my work in that. So, you know, so I feel just gloriously mentored. I'm really happy with my, you know, I mean, I, I mean, there are many negative stories about the publishing industry, but in terms of mentoring, I feel blessed. I'm grateful. Amy? Yeah, it's, I, two that come to mind, two um, moments. Or one was that I got my MFA at UC Irvine and Judith Grossman was a writer who was sort of the interim director at the time. And she was, um, there was just an openness to Judith and a kind of just a, a, a feeling of a kind of wide open range of what fiction could do and just a, a eager interest in the writing of everyone around the table and and a love of fairy tales and things like just telling us where to get good bread and coffee like it just felt so grounded in in humanness her interest and I felt very freed by her. And that was a real turning point in my writing life to be in that program. And I think she had a major part of that, of a kind of a tone she said at the table about just fiction, fiction is wide open, that we really can try things out and that she was her readership and just her, her like she's sort of a proper British woman that was is from lived in Cambridge for a while and was at Irvine for a certain amount of years. And then she just had a kind of, um, I don't know, like I also just a kind of, like she was just like pushed us to have sex in the stories if there was, you know, like go there, go there to magic. Like it just felt very freeing. And so she was really a wonderful mentor in that way. And, and maybe connected to that around that time, someone had pointed me towards reading Wheatsy Bat by Francesca Leah Block. And I hadn't read her. And in terms of someone who was an LA writer, I was living at that time on Hayworth in West Hollywood, right near Okie Dog. And like she, Okie Dog is in Wheatsy Bat. And like, I had walked by Okie Dog and like smelled the delicious chili, you know? And so it was like, and I think going back to this idea about when you're writing sort of outside of realism, this kind of debate about where to ground things is sort of always present in my mind. And there was Francesca Leo Block having this sort of fairy tale slash coming of age slash wonderful voice driven 
book that's very set in an LA that I was walking around in the day, but also kind of knowing when to name things and when not to name things. And that was also really instructive for me and maybe continues to be. And I think she is, she's just a wonderful presence um, as an LA writer. I think she occupies a kind of territory all her own. And so I think of her in that way as a kind of, as a kind of mentor too. And Amy, back to you. So it's so fascinating to me as a, I'm a California transplant and I've been here ooh, close to 40 years now, but I don't feel like a native at all. And it, it, I won't say never, but it's almost never occurred to me to set my stories here. Even after I've been here all this time, my, my, my books take place in Asia mostly, but we're back in New York. And last night I was watching the PBS documentary on Philip Roth and he was talking about the old thing of you have to leave a place in order to write about it, the Joycean kind of thing. So I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that you're all natives. This is your motherland here. And, and I wonder, um, did you ever think about leaving in order to write about Los Angeles? Or do you think that your perspective um, you know, is, is different from somebody who falls in love with LA and comes here and writes about it as a, as a transplant. Dana? I think um, yes to both of your <laughs> questions. I think, um, you know, having been born and raised here, I thought I saw the place the way I needed to see the place, but it was only after I left California to go to grad school at Indiana University, lived there for seven years, that I was really able to see um, my home state in ways that I couldn't as a native. And it really um, made me fall in love with the place all over again, just because of the, you know, the classic things that everybody loves about California, just the landscape. Um, mountains became very novel to me in Indiana because it felt so, you know, flat and like the beach and the desert and all of these things. Um, so leaving made me see with sharper eyes. Um, and, and I do think, um, I was thinking of what Susan said about people, you know, asking, you know, about water when she lives in Riverside. And I was thinking about when I first got to grad school in Indiana, someone said sort of disdainfully, oh, like, do you have a pool in your backyard? And I was just thinking, oh, wow, like their vision of place is completely informed by television or something. And so I was really interested in, again, recuperating place and writing about it through sort of like my middle class perspective and my race perspective and and so much of Los Angeles literature is caught up in the industry of Hollywood which so many of us don't care don't know about completely irrelevant and so so then you know again like I just wanted to write about the aspects of the city that I and place that I'd fallen in love with all over again and also writing with a with a truthfulness to place that kind of traditional all the literature that people have read is in the past about California doesn't quite get right you know for example Joan Didion is a beautiful writer but she's the writer that people always told me to read when I was coming up like oh you're a California writer so you have to read Didion so I did and beautiful writing aside, again, there was that version of place that didn't connect with my experience or who I was at all. And again, just sort of felt irrelevant to my point of view and experience. So everything all the time, always about writing, uh, writing about places like that in the back of my mind or in the front, rather is get it right, be truthful, no shorthand, make it new um, and be honest to your experience. Susan. 
I'm glad Dana did the thing where she brought up Joan Didion because <laughs> you knew we were going to have to go there. And um, I just, the thing about home versus away, like that's actually what this entire book is about, which is so crazy. It took me forever to write this book because yeah, the American dream is of upward mobility, right? And if you can't have upward mobility, at least you moved somewhere so you're not a loser. And I started writing this memoir, not about me, but about all those women that came before me that I was describing. Like my, my grandmother was the first head nurse for Kaiser, like Kaiser Permanente. You know, she worked at the steel mill in Fontana. So, and she was from Switzerland, one of 10 kids. All the girls were sent off to marry widowers with children. And that's who my grandmother married my grandfather after my real grandmother died. My grandmother never smiled. She never said a kind word to any of us. She was head nurse at Kaiser Steel. She would say to us, if we were like doing something like, they brought me a man today and his arm was off. I had to stop the bleeding. And we were like, okay, grandma, that's great. And then on the other side, we had Aunt Jenny. The, this is, I was searching for this picture. This is Aunt Jenny who lived at 21st and Central. The legend of Aunt Jenny that I heard when I was 14 is that she was raped and she killed the man in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She shot him in the forehead and she was saved by a white woman and she made her way out here to Los Angeles. And sort of to think about those kind of heroics, it wasn't, Dana, just as you said, it wasn't that I didn't want to read Joan Didion, but when I was 17, I went off to USC. My mom and dad dropped me off in a yellow pickup truck at USC and I didn't see them unless I got on the bus and came back here. The first person that I was supposed to read was Joan Didion and the, her iconic essay, as you all know, More Dreamer, Some Dreamers of the Golden Dream is literally set in Ontario. And I read about this woman who has killed her dentist husband by pushing his Volkswagen into a lemon grove and lighting it on fire. And I come home on the bus and I have a Xerox printout of it. And I'm standing at the Formica kitchen counter with my mom and I'm telling her, I wanna be a writer and look, here's this thing I read. And my mom's not paying attention. My little four foot 11 Swiss mom who wanted me to be a sports writer so she could meet Vince Scully. Literally, that's why I went to USC. She didn't care. I was the oldest of five kids. She wanted me to cook. So she starts paying attention. She's like, who is this woman? What is she writing about? She's writing about your Aunt Beverly Street. Your Aunt Beverly lived across the street from that woman who killed her husband. She saw the whole thing. She always knew that woman was going to kill someone. Now wash the dishes. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> Joan Didion knows us. She's making fun of us. Like my people are the ones Joan Didion makes fun of. When you're 17 and you feel like that, even though her writing is lapidary, it's beautiful, it's precise. I could never shake that feeling, Dana, that like she would look at us as though we were like insects to be impaled on a, a piece of paper. That was actually the greatest impetus for me to want to write about my place. And yes, Amy, I wanted to leave. Girl, I wanted to be Francie in a tree grows in Brooklyn and have a fire escape. That was like my dream. And then, you know, I went to New York a couple of times and it was like breakdancing time and me and Dwayne went to see like breakdancing stuff. And then we had no money and we came home and all our friends were drug dealers. And we were here and I had kids and I had 400 people to take care of and I never left. And I keep trying to balance that with Joan Didion and with Wanda Coleman and with truthfully what James Baldwin said, like no one else is gonna write about this place but you. So. I know that was a long story, but I had to say, Dana, while you were talking, that's just what I kept thinking is not that we didn't feel admiration, but right. what what is our place on here, uh, on earth here to do? And my, pla my place is my place. And Ernest J. Gaines also was helpful because he said, I went to the library and I didn't see my people there. Mm -hmm. And I wrote books because I wanted to see my people there. I literally wanted to see my people in the library. So that's... That's, it's a great question to ask, Amy. And Lisa, I'll pass it to you. Um, the being away from home is almost everything for me as a writer because, um, so I did live as an adult seven years in New York, but I've just always been a traveler. And so I've spent 
a whole lot of time in Germany and in Indonesia and in Thailand, China. And from these places, I'm, I may be writing about home or I may be writing about there. Or I may be writing about another country from this other country because I've been that sort of reader. So, um, like as a ki kid, the, well, a, a great love was Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Marguerite de Raz. And so as a reader and a writer, I think it's kind of like my arms around the globe and that LA as a world city, feeling like as a native of LA, feeling like a native of a world city, of a native of the world. So um, I really believe in that sort of global citizenship thing. And so I think that's, that's where my writing comes from. Amy? Yeah, I keep thinking about it. I mean, I do, I do feel like there's a different perspective when you are born and raised here and write about it versus moving here. But, but it's hard to pinpoint in a way. Some of it goes back to that idea I was talking about earlier where I feel like LA, like, like every big world city has a kind of mythic personality in people's imaginations and you're drawn to the sort of way it lives in your mind and then you come to it and have you know, a very different experience because it's, you know, it's just the way, I mean, I think again to Hollywood that a lot of people come to LA for opportunities in music or in film or in TV and in acting and writing, whatever, all that stuff. So, so that's very different because you have this kind of disconnect or discord in both watching the shows and living here. And so then I do feel like there's, like a lot of people I know left LA um, because of jobs or because they want to live in other places or because, you know, and, and actually are relieved, you know, LA gets a complicated rap from a lot of people, but I think it's, I think there's so, I guess part of, I think what's felt so enriching for me is thinking about then what is it like sort of from all these different ages, what is it like watching the city change? What is it like thinking about the city? So I guess I both, you know, when the Roth quote that you mentioned, Amy, about, you know, leaving and coming back, I've lived in mostly different parts of California. So there's some perspective on that, but I guess I, I feel like some of that is the quest of the human being, which is like, we're always trying to get a little space from what's familiar to see it freshly. And that mean, may mean actually physically leaving, but often not. And it's not just about place. It's also about the things that we think about. It's also about the ways we view the world. I mean, all of that stuff can be unseen. And so I think it is part of the writer's job difficultly, but, but constantly to try to re-see and to set, you know, Dana, you said a beautiful phrase of recuperate place or recuperate LA, which I love that there's something to be re- whatever recuperate is as a word, I don't know, you know, but to be sort of taken anew and that that is, that is our job on multiple fronts. So, so I do, I think what's so meaningful about being in such a large city, as Lisa was saying too, like that, that it's just gonna give back over and over and over again. To you, Amy. I love these answers. It's so wonderful. I mean, and, and, and it's, it is, it's, it's really fascinating to me, this native born thing, I think is a big question. But shifting gears a little bit um, to the business side of things. Um, we've got a, a question here from, from the audience and, and also it kind of dovetails with what I wanted to ask you about where New York has traditionally been viewed as the literary Mecca um, arguably of the world. And um, has it mattered to your career that you're based uh, here in, in, instead? And, and the question from the audience was, um, now how did you market your, your books that were based here, um, knowing that a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't really get what you were writing about? Um, and was there pushback about writing those stories beyond undergrad and grad school, i.e. from the publishing industry um, in New York, um, any any thoughts on on any of that? Starting again with you, Dana. I have to say that um, uh, New York hasn't really figured prominently in my considerations of 
of course, what I write. Um, and I feel lucky that I feel like perhaps earlier, in earlier years, it would be sort of more difficult maybe to be a California writer and get the kind of exposure or attention that you would want. But I don't, I don't know any different from what I'm experiencing now or have experienced. And so I don't really carry that feeling of if only, if only New York was paid more attention. I just don't feel any of that. I'm quite content being a California writer, born and raised in California, that being my focus. And um, so, yeah, I, I, it's, it's not been an issue for me. Susan. I think it's a good question because publishing now is, is based in so many different places. And I feel as if when I got out of graduate school and I was so young and, and drove back home, everything was about New York. And, you know, that was 1984 and that was the Brat Pack. Remember like the Brett Easton Ellis, Jay McInerney, Tama Janowitz. And so they were the first writers I saw that were in like People Magazine. And then I drove back across the country, you know, with my husband and here we were. And it was lonely because my friends were all doing these crazy things. And I was writing about this stuff that I felt like nobody would understand in The New Yorker. And yet that's where I was supposed to send my things, you know? And I have to say that I, read, I wrote for seven years without ever sending anything out. I wrote stories about my friends who were like growing weed. And I, I wrote about methamphetamine. I wrote also, my stories had a lot of Spanish in them. And so like I, here we wouldn't say que pasa, we would say que paes. And so if I would send my story out, somebody like, well, this is just spelled wrong. I'd be like, that's not, what, you don't get to say that. And I had hoopty, you guys are gonna bust up, but I probably published the first story that had the word hoopty in it. And hoopty was a car and people were like, you need to translate this for people. And I'm like, no, I don't. Like, that's just a thing. And that that's how New York felt to me is that there was a little bit of that. But maybe because I was an idiot and I was at home, I was, was like, no, that's how it's, that's how the word is. And they, they were like, well, so you should change it for the general readership. I'm like, I'm just writing for myself then. Like, <laughs> So there was that. But my first publisher was Milkweed, a small press in Minneapolis, and they treated me very well. My next publisher was Hyperion, which is owned by Disney and was very New York. After that, I was with Pantheon, very New York, Houghton Mifflin, very New York. Then I was with Catapult, which is the New York arm, but Dana is published by Counterpoint, the, uh, the great California arm. So I feel like publishing is, there's great publishers everywhere now. And so the question is a little different. My next book comes out from FSG, which is very New York, but both my editors are third generation Californian. So I think we're gonna be okay. And just the same thing, they're not gonna say, no one would say, you know, get by us. They're gonna be like, oh, okay. That's what he says. So I think that it's the, that lovely way that America has to open up. I'm hoping that that, that is happening. Um, Lisa, over to you. You mentioned that Brett Eaton Ellis time and that was, and I'll say that was around like 14 years ago. Um, no, 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 20, how many years ago? I'm not sure, but it took me um, 14 years to get a book deal because I, on the basis of my short stories, I had an agent from William Morris um, and he shopped my work everywhere. And all the publishers at that time, at that Brett Eaton Ellis time said, what do we do with a black female writer who's not writing uh, stereotypical black characters? And so, um, so I just kept, you know, sending stories out and I wrote two novels. I had a story collection. Nothing happened until a small press called Kuhn Press um, asked me if I wanted to publish my short stories. But I do want to backtrack and mention Karen Rinaldi because when she was an assistant at Ra Random House, she read my unsolicited manuscript. So this is before I even had an agent. She read it and wrote me a letter saying, you know, uh, you have a fan here, you know, um, write your novel, let me know what happens. She didn't have the power then, but um, 
later when I did, she tried to buy my book for a uh, crown. And so then cut to the years later, once I was published by Kuhn Press, she was able to buy the paperback rights um, when she was heading Bloomsbury. So she is a great mentor, a great champion, great supporter, all those years as she was coming up, you know, so, uh, so that's, that's my publishing story. Amy? Yeah, it's my, my publishers in New York. And I mean, I think I really didn't know about New York that much when I first got published. So there were certain things that, that friends of mine who were writers or who had lived there were like, you know, this is good that you got this or this is not good or whatever. And I was really unaware of it. And I, in some ways that was helpful, but, but I do remember my, I got a review from the New York Times and that was a really big deal, which I didn't, I mean, I was very excited, but I didn't really understand what does it mean? And the review was sort of half positive. This was for the girl in the flammable skirt, but also had some line about like a bikini, the bikini something, there's not a bikini in the book, you know, like the like it was sort of a, a diminishment, like it was a little disdainful. And I didn't really know what to do with it, but these same friends were like, yeah, that's the LA New York thing. That's the sort of New York putting down the LA writer. And because it's it sort of reminds me, Dana, of what you were saying about like, do you have a pool? You know, this sort of just like, we're all walking around in our bikinis. <laughs> like, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing, but but I think and it was fine. It was it, very exciting that the book was out. Da, 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 da. But but I think um, my sense is this: what that was ninety eight. That was nineteen ninety eight. And what felt you know more entrenched, newly to me, more entrenched at that point. I feel like has has also loosened up a lot, and that it does feel like there is a because of like what Susan was saying about all these different presses and this this atmosphere and publishing where there's just a greater awareness of the need for variety of voices and how essential that is, that it would feel kind of silly to th at this point, I think, to think that we, you know, things need to be more about New York, you know, like, of course not. So I think that that feels nice. It feels more spacious. Yeah, it's interesting. I think I'm older than all of you. So I remember the very beginning, you know, I started publishing in 19, the 1970s. Um, and, and I think one of the differences maybe that has been bigger than anybody realizes is that so much of the industry is now done online. I mean, when I started, you met your agent, you met your editors, you had lunch. It was all, you know, in the present moment, physical space kind of thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why New York was the place um, and people didn't, from, from the industry didn't live out here. So they didn't have those kinds of physical encounters. And so we were just, it was like we didn't exist. And so once everything started to happen online, I think that's a big reason why it's changed. It's gone global. It's not just LA, it's everywhere. Um, but it's much less of an issue now. So one of our um, audience people has, has asked the question, where do you see the history of immigrant stories in women's uh, stories of LA. And we've touched on a little bit of that. Susan, you've been talking about people coming here from different places. And Lisa, your mother came from Panama. Um, anybody got any, any thoughts on how the, the immigrant stories dovetail? Uh, if, you, if you deal with that, if you're thinking of that in your own work, um, Dana, yeah. you can start or anybody can jump in if you've got thoughts. I mean, I'm just remembering a student, um, former student Juliana Wang, whose book Home Remedies came out a couple of years ago and is about um, a lot of stories about uh, young millennial Chinese and Chinese American immigrants in LA and in Beijing. And it's a wonderful collection because it really is sort of jumping from city to city and it feels very grounded in a very, in a younger voice. It's just really exciting to see because you see again, this kind of, um, global perspective. So she pops to mind right away. And I, I have been writing about that since I was 17, which is funny because my first novel um, that was sort of everyone in New York called it a California novel, but High Wire Moon uh, was about a young woman who immigrates here from Oaxaca. And I started that novel when I was 19. I started it 
riding in my car. Um, I worked at a gas station during home from the summer from USC. My stepdad worked at a linen plant in High Grove in the middle of the orange groves. And La Migra came, immigration back then had green vans and they came and took 17 women away from the linen plant. And he told me about it and I started this novel. And what's crazy is some of the same characters that were in that book are in my new book because people are still immigrating all the time. You see 20, 25 people were in an SUV in Holtville, which is in Imperial County. And right now I'm writing about Mecca and Thermal and Oasis, which is in the Coachella Valley and how people immigrate and where they live in ranchos, often on tribal land owned by indigenous people in Torres Martinez. So I think it's always, we're always gonna be writing about people who come to California and really consider it the promised land, don't they, my fellow writers? Like for us, it's home and for people who are arriving, they're like, this really is the promised land. I don't know about you guys, but everywhere I go around the world, if I'm in Turkey or Sicily or Mexico and I'm talking about being from California, just to like anyone, they're all start singing Hotel California to me and telling me that they wanna to come to California. All the Turkish men, all the Mexican guys, everyone. And I'm with my girls, my daughters who all are very beautiful. And they're like, we just wanna to go to California where all the beautiful women like your daughters live. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Lisa, did your mother's experience um, filter into your your work? Well, I it's it's been years of working on the novel of my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother's life. So that that hasn't um, ma fully materialized yet. But as an editor at um, Los Angeles Review of Books for the past five years, assigning um, a plethora of immigrant stories. I mean, you know, I, and I don't wanna mention like certain particular books because it's just, I can't even count how many I've assigned over the past five years, but many, 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 many. So um, anyone who's interested, just take a look at the fiction section in Los Angeles Review of Books to see a bit of like the loves <laughs> of immigrant stories, yeah. So uh, we're almost out of time here, but um, very quickly, uh, just honoring the fact that we have uh, been writing our way through a pandemic for the last year since the last AWP in San Antonio. And I just wonder if um, you've got people or aspects of the LA literary community that has really come through for you or been helpful to you um, in, in getting you through this year. And that might give people a window into what our LA literary community looks like right now. Um, maybe just a, a quick quick round around the room to see if if any anything comes to mind. Uh, I just, Dana? I have a great uh, writing group that it's just nice to have to show pages to and to kind of pep talk each other has been really nice. And then the other sort of tranquility writing thing that I've been doing is I listen to a lot of audio books while I walk around downtown. And um, it's just like nice, you're getting a reading every day or several hours of a reading if you have time to do that. So, um, that's what I've been doing. Susan. This is crazy, but my entire life for a pandemic is surrounded by people. I have my uh, two of my grown daughters and my son-in-law live here. I live in a really um, crowded neighborhood. My neighbor Mario next door was one of the first hundred people in Southern California to get COVID. Um, he is now building a boxing ring in the backyard today. He survived after 10 days in the hospital last March. And that was the beginning of my neighborhood being decimated by COVID. Um, probably 15, 20 people that are close to me have died. So there was a lot of cooking, but I have to say that books is what saved me. There's all these books behind me. I started a fence library. I have a big fence, it's a busy street. So I have five shelves out there and my neighbors came and bolted them to the fence and we painted them and hundreds and hundreds of people drop off books every week and hundreds of books go. 
and it was featured on the ABC News at night and then more people have been driving in from Irvine and dropping off books. So I'm a librarian now and it's all free books and people come and take maybe 50 books or people take one book. But um, that has really saved me because you know what, Dana, just like you said about listening to the books, I find books out there. So yesterday I read Betsy Tacey because somebody left a, an old copy of Betsy Tacey and you know people have been leaving amazing books so to give away maybe four or 500 books a week, that's been really something. It's kept me going. Fantastic. Like Susan, <laughs> I love, love that. Book love, colleague love, friends love, family love, and hiking. Hiking's my big save. Hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains, Griffith Park, walks on the beach, walk it out hike it out, that's the thing, sitting in the sun. Amy. Yeah, I think uh, um, I have a longstanding book group. We're figuring out you know, ways to meet on Zoom. That's been helpful, little backyard visits to my parents. That's been a nice thing to be able to do. And yes, like Lisa, walks, the trees. Right now it's particularly beautiful in Los Angeles. So um, yeah. The little bit of nature, all the different kinds of nature. Looking for peregrine falcons with my kids because they're apparently, we haven't found one yet, but we're looking. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this has really been a wonderful conversation. It's great to hear all of your stories. And uh, I heard the other day that some bookstores are starting to plan in-person events uh, at the end of May. So, we may be moving out of here soon, <laughs> but in the meantime, thank you from the Zoom room and thank you to AWP and Dana, Susan, Amy, Lisa, wonderful to see you. Thank you all. Thank you. Loved talking with all of you. Thanks for the great questions, Amy. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Amy and AWP. Thank you, Amy. Yes, thank you, everybody.